All right. Welcome to the South Asian Public Health Association Spotlight Series, where we shine a light on the extraordinary individuals shaping the landscape of public health with a focus on the South Asian community. We're your hosts, Samira, president of the South Asian Public Health Association, also known as SAFA. Aisha, vice president. And Mashira, co-chair of the Event Planning and Professional Development Committee for SAFA. Uh, and we here at SAFA are committed to advancing the health and well-being of South Asians in the U.S. and beyond, uh, fostering collaboration, advocacy, and research to address health disparities and promote equitable outcomes. A podcast series dives into captivating conversations with influential figures in public health. Stay tuned for inspiring stories, insightful discussions, and a closer look at the impactful work of SAFA over the past 25 years. Learn more about us and explore the wealth of resources we offer at www.safa.org. Today, we continue our journey celebrating Safa's 25th anniversary with a very special guest. So in our inaugural episode, we had the privilege of speaking with one of the co-founders of Safa, Dr. Ushma Ukwadye, whose pioneering work has paved the way for our organization's impactful journey. Today, we are honored to welcome Dr. Umer Shah, Secretary of Health for the state of Washington, and also the first South Asian to assume this role in the state's history, which is an amazing feat. Um, Dr. Shah is a trailblazer in public health with a distinguished career spanning two decades, marked by leadership roles in emergency medicine, public health, uh, innovation, and advocacy for underserved communities. Dr. Shah has also been an integral part of SAFA's board um, and has served on the board for many years, as well as serving as SAFA's president back in 2009. Um, so Dr. Shah, welcome to the SAFA Spotlight series. As we dive into your remarkable journey, could you maybe share a brief overview of your career in public health um, and your path to becoming the Secretary of Health for the state of Washington? Oh my, that's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a big question starting off, but uh, first off, uh, just thank you to the three of you and to Safa for inviting me and and just continuing the the incredible work and the legacy and why it's so important for South Asian uh, health professionals to be together and in particular South Asian public health professionals to come together. And so just a, a, a great shout out to the three of you and your leadership team and thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, you know, I will tell you that my my journey um, is is maybe uh, both atypical and typical. Um, son of immigrant uh, parents uh, in the U.S. Uh, parents were trying to figure out which direction to go, what was happening, trying to understand the landscape. Um, my father, in particular, had some health issues when when I was growing up, and I think every time I was thinking about going off to law school or or doing something else. Um, although I did change from a molecular biology major to philosophy, but I didn't tell them until graduation. So that was a that was kind of a secret. Um, it, there was something about health and medicine that always brought me back uh, to uh, what I saw with them. And then when I was an undergrad, um, as I mentioned, I was very interested in in um, health and healthcare and medicine. But I was also interested in exploring another side of me, which was humanities. And um, I was thinking that I was going to move into going into law or policy work. And then my mom had a, a devastating stroke um, when I was finishing my senior year of, of uh, undergrad. And um, I was going to take a year off. I was going to travel the world. I was going to do teaching and all sorts of maybe Peace Corps, but with her stroke, it it made it very clear that I had to uh, really focus on what was best for family and also focus on what was best for career. And so um, fortunately, I was able to uh, go to medical school and um, I did medical school in Ohio and I was able to, to continue that journey um, but I remember every time I was in medicine, even in med school, I kept thinking about, gosh, there's more than just, um, you know, the molecular biology or the chemistry or the biophysics or whatever it is that we were learning. Um, and so I read something um, in the back of a chapter of a, of a book that was one of our textbooks, and the, it was probably something that nobody read because it was about like, um, 
population health or global health and and you know and you or something it was like one of those where nobody read it right it had nothing to do with the test nobody's gonna read it we were reading about viruses and bacteria but but this is something that of course i read and um it was about the who's um um program uh to work with uh nation states to eradicate uh smallpox and uh it was in the 50s 60s and 70s and as you know the last uh at least in um in, in 1977 was the last uh, case of smallpox in 78 was when it was declared eradicated and so here i was reading this as a med student in ohio thinking i want to go to the who and I want to learn about global health, and I want to see where that work happens. And so I um, um, went through a lot of, we didn't have uh, email then, I guess, or maybe we did. I don't remember if we knew how to use it, but I was making phone calls. And, I was, and next thing you know, I was on a plane to Geneva uh, to do a two-month uh, externship in international health and policy. And the reason I bring that journey up is that when I came back to medical school, finishing up medical school and then going to University of Texas for residency, that stayed with me throughout, that that I, I, I saw what my parents had gone through and their individual health stories. I saw the stories of patients and the individuals that we were caring for in training as well as when I, when I left training. But what really stayed with me was I wanted to get back to community and I wanted to think about big populations. And so while eventually I, I became an emergency department physician, had a 20-year career uh, through the VA hospital in Houston at Texas Medical Center, that never left me. And at one point, I decided that I didn't want to actually be the emergency department uh, director. I wanted to be... Um, um, I wanted to use the, the master's in public health that I had obtained, and I wanted to use it for population health. And so... That's when I ventured, still continued emergency um, uh, work, but I ventured into public health. And that was a long, 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 long time ago, 2003, so 20 plus years ago. And at that time, it was a real opportunity for me to get back to community. Fast forward, I went to Harris County, which is third largest county in the U.S., and uh, we went through all sorts of emergencies. Um, I was the, the medical branch co-director for the 27,000 evacuees that were at the Astrodome for Hurricane Katrina that had left the Gulf Coast. Uh, we had Hurricanes Katrina, Rita, Ike, Harvey, uh, H1N1, Ebola, Zika. We had uh, tropical storms. We had chemical incidents. We had all sorts of you know, other kinds of mass casualty and, 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 and real uh, challenges. And um, I deployed globally to Kashmir after the earthquake, um, 2005, 2006. I went to Haiti after the Port-au-Prince earthquake. Um, again, more than 100,000 in the first earthquake and more than 200,000 who perished in both earthquakes. Um, and I wanted to respond globally. And so I continued in my role in Harris County and then a pandemic occurred. And I um, was on the front lines for the first year in Houston, responding along with my team. And then the governor uh, and his team in Washington about a, a year in um, asked me to join to help uh, fight for the state of Washington. And guess what? I arrived the week that vaccines, COVID vaccines arrived in the state of Washington. My wife and kids were not very happy about that decision. We left Texas. We came up and... Um, it's been it's been a journey for three plus years now, uh, being the secretary of health uh, for this great state with uh, eight million people, so much diversity, so much beauty, but also so many challenges. So maybe in a nutshell, healthcare, public health, global, domestic emergencies, non-emergencies, and really the the always connection with with my family and what I saw with what they went through for their own health needs. That's always stayed with me as both a practitioner in healthcare, but also a practitioner in public health. Wow. And, <laughs> yeah, and it's been such an incredible journey. And um, you know, you you talked about the salience of family and how 
as a child of immigrant parents and a little bit about your own um, filial responsibilities that you might have experienced through this um, um, journey. Um, and it's certainly been marked by diverse experiences, like you said, your um, your, your um, professional experiences and then your personal and then um, all across the globe, uh, the World Health Organization. Um, we do want to ask you one thing, though, uh, is about the um, the 10 real Houstonians will need the most in the zombie apocalypse. Um, <laughs> which, uh, we, tell us more about that, please. Yeah, we saw that <laughs> in your bio. It was very interesting. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it was uh, probably one of the highlights of my of my career. You know, you you do a lot of things, and then uh, one day uh, you see your name somewhere, and I saw my name in a top ten list. Uh, if there was a zombie apocalypse, uh, that I would be apparently uh, doing um, emergency response and logistics, and uh, and and apparently saving a community from zombies, and. Uh, so I, I love that. Uh, I've somewhere I've got a photo of the of the actual article, but I will tell you, um, it was one of the most um, uh, endearing um, recognitions because you get always the the classic ones, but uh, that one was really unique. And uh, I, I I can't tell you um, that I have gone through a zombie apocalypse yet, and I'm not even sure if if I could survive it myself, but. I've, According to at least one magazine, I am the one you should be calling, and uh, so I'm ready to ready to respond. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. You know, public health professionals always already already for anything. <laughs> you know, right. mentorship plays such a crucial role in professional development. Are there any mentors or role models who have influenced your career and journey along the way, and what lessons have you learned from them? You now, additionally, you know, what advice do you have for emerging public health professionals who are seeking mentors? Yeah, you know, I, I think I think mentorship is so critical. We have to pass along what we have learned, but we also have to be respectful of the people who have been there before. Um, there's actually an interesting um, what I uh, have started to really appreciate here in this in in being in this role here in Washington. As you know, we have uh, 29 federally recognized uh, tribes, and they have a notion in uh, tribal uh, lore around seven generations. What have you learned from the seven generations of, of elders that have passed that history to, to the current generation that passes it along and thinks about the future for the next seven generations. So, so I, I think it's such a beautiful way of thinking about the connectedness. And as you know, in South Asian culture and history, a lot of it is about oral traditions. A lot of it is how do we, how do we, uh, you know, relate to our our grandparents? How do we relate to the next generation that's coming after us? Our, our nephews and nieces and others in the community. Uh, you know, we call each other uncles and aunties, right? You you say that and you know, even if you haven't met somebody, you know, we'd say that to our children, right? They've never met Aisha. They've never met you. If if they meet you, I would say this is Auntie Aisha, right? And, you know, it's this, this connection that we have. So, you know, from the standpoint of mentorship, I will tell you that um, I feel like I, I, I have been so fortunate to be mentored both in medicine as well as in public health by, by people that I worked with, you know, whether it was attendings, uh, whether it's uh, uh, faculty members, uh, there's there's somebody that I um, uh, just had this incredible conversation with just a, a week or two back who um, helped mentor me when I was doing my work with uh, patients with HIV, uh, especially women with HIV. And he was such an incredible mentor for me. And he reminded me of, of just how important it was to connect what we were doing in the healthcare setting with what's happening in the in the community setting. And then I think about my previous director at uh, both in uh, the smaller health uh, jurisdiction that I was at when I was a chief medical officer over two FQHCs, um, as well as the, the director um, at Harris County uh, Public Health, who was this incredible uh, Latina uh, leader that just showed this incredible amount of 
of of willpower and and um we we went through so many emergencies together and so learned so much from her um and then you know the the mentors uh that you and, and there are many 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 more and and i'm sure if some, one of them hears this says you've left me out i'm so sorry because there's so many more than you can count um but then i think about my professor who i just learned my undergraduate professor in philosophy who just passed away and i will tell you he was a, a professor of philosophy uh, John Locke at Vanderbilt uh, University. He was just this amazing spirit. Um, he had this energy about him. His classes were always oversubscribed, but he had this humility about how he treated people. And he, when I mentioned with what happened with both my father and mother with some of their health challenges, he took me under his wing and and he reminded me that no matter what, that he believed in me and that he knew that I was going to be able to overcome those challenges. And when you have somebody who believes in you, I think that is what ultimately allows us to be successful. And, and so then I try to pass that along, right, uh, to others. And I think the, the whether it's my journey or whether it's what I've seen is that public health is so such an incredible field, but it's so diverse and so wide in the path you can take to get to uh, where you're going. And so you don't actually go A to Z, you go A through a number of, you know, C's and D's and R's and L's and all these letters. And sometimes it's actually, we, we're so, especially um, in certain um, uh, parts of public health, we, we wanna get to the, to the actual destination. But I think part of the journey is, is really the fun part. And so I always encourage, uh, mentees to really think about how do they navigate that space in a way that allows them to explore the field of public health, but also explore their own career interests. And then the final thing I would say, um, not just my um, my sister, who uh, is an incredible lawyer, uh, my wife is an incredible dentist, uh, what I've learned from them, but from my parents, I learned this notion of um, do good and do well, that you have a responsibility to, to do well, that you have to, you know, you have to perform, people have to believe in you, they have to trust that you know what you're doing, you're competent, um, that you're successful. Um, but you also have to do good. Um, you have to give, think about giving back to community and the service that, that really comes in. And, and doing only one, like only being successful, but not doing good or only being about good, but not being good at what you do um, is, is, is really not good enough. And so that notion of do good and do well has been something that's also served me throughout my career. And I try to pass that along to other students. And that's so powerful, honestly, uh, when you were talking about, uh, you know, how we look to our elders and it's that idea of uh, legacy or generativity. And then even in your, um, the closing, um, you know, you mentioned how, um, what you learned from your parents. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's so critical. Um, and there was another, you know, we wanted to ask you, we were rather intrigued to, and you sort of alluded to it a couple of times about your background in um, philosophy. And um, we were so um, interested to learn more about that experience. Can you tell us a little bit more, especially about, you know, how did that degree shape your perceptions of public health or your own um, career broadly? Yeah, you know, I, I think it could probably be um, the the good and the bad of somebody's career when you when you're uh, doing something. I I was a molecular biology major. I was looking at microscopes, and my my professor. I still remember that moment. He came into the room and he said, um, "You know, um, you're good at this, uh, but gosh, it looks like you 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 know you want to talk to people and you want to you want to be with people and and I don't know if that you know." microscopes and 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 looking at you know bacteria or whatever it is that we were looking at I don't know if that's what you want to do cells are one thing 
but it sounds like, or it seems like you're, you'd be really good at talking to people. And so fast forward, I also concurrently took that class in philosophy with Dr. Locks, and um, it blew my mind in the sense of, um, you know, just how critical the thinking that goes into the humanities. And, and, and oftentimes when we're in, in health uh, or healthcare or medicine or science, we, we oftentimes are really thinking about that as being the end all be all. And I, I've made this argument with, with many people that it's, the, it's necessary but not sufficient. And what's really important is for our ability to be able to connect as human beings. And that's what humanities or philosophy or you know, history or English or social studies or anthropology, that's what it, they teach you. They teach you the importance of being a human being. And sometimes we are so busy with every single thing that we do, we forget how do we connect with human beings. And um, a clinical example is when I was um, young, my, my aunt was diagnosed with stage four metastatic breast cancer, and um, she eventually wound up passing away. But fast forward, when I was in my medical education, I was taught that you should never talk about that with a patient who has breast cancer. And it took me 20 years of my clinical journey to recognize that that was actually not the right advice. And I absolutely believe you should have parameters and you should have, you know, uh, guardrails. But I do think that what we need to be doing is reminding ourselves that there is an opportunity to connect with people. And we've sometimes do a disservice to our own selves in public health, where especially during COVID-19 or even other emergencies, we wear our, you know, our white coats and our stethoscopes, or we, you know, have the science badge and we have all those things. We, we say, trust us because we are the professionals. And I actually don't believe that's good enough. We have to be better at communicating and being part of community. And that's how you engender trust. And so to me, it's been a, a long journey of, of how do you do that? And it's, um, I learn every single day because I don't think I'm perfect. And, and certainly I, I, I do believe that our field has, has been under such uh, duress over the last few years, especially with this pandemic. Um, but I always remember the philosophy and that humanity's teaching that stays with me every time, um, you know, there's a new situation that comes up. Um, when uh, we had children's vaccines for COVID-19 that were, that were being released, um, the, you know, the team said, well, you know, talk as the Secretary of Health. And I actually didn't speak as the Secretary of Health. I didn't even speak as a public health practitioner or as a physician or a healthcare provider. I spoke as a father and as a co-parent. And I said every single day, my wife and I are concerned about the health and well-being of our kids. And that's why we are uh, making sure that our kids get vaccinated. So, you know, fast forward, I, I do think that oftentimes we, we miss the opportunity to connect with community. And when we do that, then, then community doesn't know us, doesn't recognize us, and certainly doesn't trust us. And I think that's a real challenge that we have. So I do think, uh, sorry, I know you were trying to get into more Personal, I, I went a little bit more uh, no, serious there, but, a, but an opportunity for us to really think about um, humanities that come into sciences as well. Yeah, I think you make a really great point about community and how essential it is to really, I think, moving things forward because you can't, you know, you can come up with all the great treatments and whatever that you have, but without buy-in from the community, it's not really going to go anywhere. Um, and, you know, we all are always looking, especially with the pandemic and, and a lot of the social isolation that occurred, you know, everyone's really looking for community now um, and how to build stronger community. And for us, you know, SAFA really, I think, serves as a form of community, uh, especially for board members, but also people who participate. Um, and so just, you know, turning the conversation a little bit back over to SAFA um, and your role and how, you know, in SAFA and how it came to be what it is today. 
um, you know, and how it affected your career. So what we wanted to know was, you know, how did you become involved with the organization? What sparked your interest in South Asian public health? And then how has your experience with Safa really influenced your work that's, um, you know, that you're doing now? Yeah, no, I think that that's uh, a, a, a couple of great questions. And I, I will just keep it very brief in saying that when I uh, was first exposed to public health, especially at uh, APHA, the American Public Health Association, I started to, to hear about SAFA, but I still wasn't quite familiar. Uh, but then somebody had forwarded, me, forwarded an email to me that was some sort of, at that time, it, it might have been a, uh, a Yahoo group. Do those even exist now? You know, these these, you know, you subscribe to, and there was, it was a listserv. And, and, and there were all these South Asian public health professionals that were sending information back and forth about maternal child health, or here's a new research study, or uh, we're interested in, you know, learning about uh, mental health uh, counseling, all sorts of information that was going out that I was just, just amazed by. And to me, that really sparked that interest in how important it is to have um, both public health come together, but also South Asian public health professionals come together. And uh, that's where SAFA came out of it. Now, eventually it went from just being on a listserv to meeting people in person, uh, to um, various uh, both professional and social events that were occurring, uh, to eventually leadership. And somebody had encouraged me to consider being on the board for SAFA. And that's where I, um, found my 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 peeps if you will and so that's where we uh that's where we started to roll in a lot of the stuff that was happening with public health issues uh related to SAFA and I'm just I'm just so pleased that you all are continuing to keep that tradition alive. It's been so wonderful to hear how people get involved with SAFA. I actually also found out about SAFA through my sister who shared the um, announcement with me about the group and encouraged me to apply. And so it's pretty cool to hear the backgrounds of folks. Um, how, how do you think your experience with SAFA influenced your growth in, into the public health field? And what aspects of SAFA did you enjoy the most? You know, I, I think about, you know, there are both um, um, my uh, colleagues that who were there on the board at that time, um, uh, Natasha Chaudhary and uh, uh, Arna Mukherjee and, and uh, uh, Ranjita Mizra, and just, just people that were just so amazing. And I'm sure at some point you're gonna be able to connect with them. Um, there was somebody on our board that unfortunately had passed away at that time while serving on the board. Um, and uh, we we had just gone through so much together. And what I what I do think that what Safa both the Safa the organization and Safa the board did was that it really brought people together who didn't have a place to come together. Yes, there were Asian American Pacific uh, you know Islander big Api groups, if you will. Uh, there were groups that were for medical, right? South Asian medical professionals or um, healthcare professionals, but there wasn't a group that brought both South Asian um, and public health together. And so it really allowed for learning about our own history, uh, what's challenging our own people, our own communities, and how do we work together to shed light on on what's happening, but also to come up with solutions and, and to do that in a way that really focused our attention on South Asian community as, as a construct and also not just the healthcare pieces, but how health truly operates and, and the um, uh, underlying social and structural determinants of health, how that all comes in. I think that was really what Safa did. And so for me, the opportunity to lead was was an incredible honor. I was like, really, you want me to lead? I mean, this is that's amazing. Um, but at the same time, I I, I realized that it, it was such an opportunity to give back because I had gotten so much from Safa myself that it was an opportunity to make it a better organization, uh, to to help with. Um, we had done fact sheets at that time, a number of fact sheets. So there was a brown paper that had been released uh, 
prior to uh, when I was in, um, on the board. But uh, during um, our board term, we actually looked at things like uh, oral health or emergency preparedness. And we had come up with fact sheets that were uh, that we had released to to really raise some of that interim knowledge about what was happening with um, with South Asian health, and then certainly the next uh, brown uh, you know brown book or brown paper, whatever it was called, uh, and uh, really again just focusing the attention, but then also seeing all these incredible folks, uh, people like you, uh, that that come. And, and really want to also contribute to the work, but also to learn what others are going through or have gone through. So you can pass it along and also to help solve some challenges in your own careers. And I think that's what SAPA is all about. So I, I think it's just a great opportunity for people to, to stay connected. Yeah, a lot of what you've said really resonates with me also, you know, just taking on the presidency over the past two years. Um, the opportunity to give back, I think, is really important because, you know, you're actually contributing to a lot of the work that's being done and the impact that's being made. And I think over the past 25 years, SAFA has achieved so many milestones, you know, just becoming a 501c3 and, and getting that status, but publishing influential research, like you had mentioned, getting prestigious awards, uh, really partnering with a lot of uh, great organizations and then advocating for health equity um, and then, you know, our impact has also expanded to legislative advocacy where, you know, I think over the past couple of years, we've been supporting um, the need for the South Asian Heart Health Awareness and Research Act um, that's still, you know, sitting in Congress and then participating in national health campaigns, establishing a noteworthy presence in D.C. Um, we've met with the Secretary of Health. We've been invited to the White House. And I think um, a lot of that has been growing, um, you know, and it started with the the people who had really built Safa up, you know, like you and and all the people you had mentioned. Um, and so looking ahead, where do you believe Safa can have the most impact in the next 25 years? I think one of the challenges for Safa has uh, over time has continued to be to to be in a place where it has the resources to do everything that it is interested in doing. And what I've what I've noticed about South uh, um, Asian public health professionals is that they have a lot of heart. Uh, their heart's in the right place. They want to give back. They want to give to community. They want to help. Um, but they don't always have the the either the pathway, which is what SAFA provides, or the resources to be able to to do that. And so, what I'd like to see in the next twenty five years is SAFA to be in a in a markedly better fiscal and financial setting, um, so uh, financial footing that allows for it to um, really do everything that it wants to do. Right. Um, if it's uh, having the chapters that are going to be in other communities, well, great. There's a West Coast or even if, you know, uh, it, it's not in a community specific, but there is a, a uh, sector specific uh, or region specific type of chapters. I think there's an opportunity really to do that, but you need resources to be able to do that. The other is really that influence, as you just mentioned, around um, being at the White House or, you know, with congressional leaders, those who are making decisions within health and human services, maybe not even to be with them, but to actually have South Asian public health professionals who are part of them, right? They are the leaders that you're talking to, right? So you you have people that aren't just trying to hear you or listen to your issues or challenges or what you're trying to accomplish as SAFA, but they're actually former SAFA Members, right, and, and and that is when when you really start to see uh, what Safa has done to to be at that next level, um, and then and then maybe the third piece I would say is this real intersection of what global and domestic health are all about. That what is happening across the globe has impact to us here domestically, and what domestically here we do has impact across the globe. And we know so many immigrants and refugees, but also just community members who are part of the, you know, the the diaspora of what is here in the U.S. Um, there, there's really an opportunity for Safa to lead and shine in those connections of what's what's in all of our hearts with communities, both here as well as where maybe either we're from or our parents are from or our grandparents are from. I think it's an opportunity really to show that connection. 
And so SAFA can do just some amazing things. Yes, it needs investment. Yes, we want to make sure there's an impact. But it's also this connectedness that really allows SAFA to be uh, incredibly important in what all of us are trying to accomplish in our careers. Yeah, and again, um, that's such a um, powerful vision uh, because um, you talked about um, having that visibility, that presence, um, resources, of course, but then also, yeah, that global piece. We're living in an increasingly diverse world and we're all connected in some form or the other, uh, that diasporic connections that you mentioned. Um, just shifting gears a little bit, because you also talked about challenges and issues and in the field of public health, what, um, in your opinion or experience, what do you think are the most pressing public health issues uh, faced by uh, South Asian communities today? And um, what can we uh, or organizations like SAFA do uh, to address them effectively? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I believe very strongly um, at our own uh, state health agency, we have espoused these three cornerstone values of equity, innovation, and engagement. And we call them the EIE principles or EIE values. Uh, it starts and centers with equity and the work that happens in community, that we have to be innovative. It's not just about the tools and technologies, but also the creative space for people to, to be able to do innovative work, and then engagement. We can't do it alone. We have to do it together. When I think about those three, it really comes to mind this, this question of yours around what, you know, what really is happening in our own communities, that you know, we have to have an equity lens applied to South Asian communities and what they're going through. We have to be thinking about different ways of solving the issues because the same ways that aren't always successful over the years. And then we also have to recognize both the people and the tools that are necessary. Yes, that includes investments, but it also includes engagement for all of us. And what we want to do, and, and I do think it's so important, is we want to increase that, that knowledge base. And that's what Safa is so good at doing, is increasing the knowledge base of what are those issues, why are they important, and how can we not truly achieve health equity unless we address those health inequities. And that's where I think it's so important for us to be able to do that. And that's where SAFA comes in. But also I think that's important for anybody that's a public health professional, especially from a South Asian background, working with South Asian communities to be able to really understand the nuances. So when my parents would, you know, would would talk about uh, or, or let me let me back up when when a physician, a fellow physician of mine would say, or a nurse or counselor would say to my my mom and dad something about, well, you need to be thinking about, you know, your diet. And here's a list of all the, you know, the things that you should be looking at. And my, my uh, parents would look at them and they would simply take the piece of paper and they would politely put it in their pocket and they would leave and they would come home and say, this person has no idea, none of my culture and what we eat and drink and how we go about doing that. And so if we as South Asian public health professionals can't sh uh, shed the light on that cultural critical importance of, of what is happening in our own communities, then no one will. And so I think it's a really important piece for us to be able to shed light on, on the cultural nuances of what's happening in our communities. And I think that's where a SAPA comes in, but that's also a South Asian public health professionals come in. Now you bring up a, a really great point. And I think just, you know, the fact that we need a lot more South Asian visibility within the field of public health is important um, so that there is a lot more culturally tailored work that's being done. Um, and, you know, we've had, you know, I think, such a great time talking to you and listening to, uh, you know, all the wisdom that you've uh, imparted on us. And I'm sure our listeners will appreciate it as well. But as we come to a close, um, you know, we wanted to know if you had any parting words of wisdom to inspire and motivate individuals who are aspiring to work in South Asian public health and really, you know, do a lot of the work that you're talking about that needs to be done. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, uh, three as well, for, for the opportunity as well as uh, being willing to listen. So uh, I appreciate that. So you didn't turn your cameras off and you didn't, um, <laughs> you didn't, uh, you didn't hit the leave button. So 
that means that that you you stayed interested. So I appreciate the three of you. Um, you know, I would say my my words of advice, uh, if if that's what I would call it, is is just to um, what I've started to say lately is this relentless pursuit of health. We have to um, be thinking about this relentless pursuit of health, and sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's really dark and challenging. And sometimes we do not see the light. And sometimes we wonder why we woke up in the career that we woke up in and why we didn't do something else. And it would have been a lot easier or there would have been other benefits or what have you. And I think those are the times where we have to remember why we went into what we went into. And so my words of wisdom to people are is, is to be relentless but also to recognize what you're doing is so important to the people you're serving. If you're not in those seats, then someone else may be in the, that seat and may not care and may not even be willing or interested in making impact. And so I think it's really important for people to remember that when things are not so happy. Um, my, my, my parents always used to say that when, um, when there's a birthday or a party, Everybody shows up, but it's in those tough moments. That's when you know who's truly your friend or truly who cares or truly who's interested. And I think that's where public health comes in is that we oftentimes, we miss that opportunity to really do what we can for communities, even when we do not see light at the end of the tunnel. And there's so much darkness right now in the world. There's so many things that are happening across the globe across our country and our communities every single day. So I wouldn't give, I wouldn't honestly, I wouldn't blame anybody if they just said, that's it, I'm done. I give up, I, I'm, I don't wanna do it. But if you do that, then you lose out on that opportunity to really make an impact. And so uh, the final thing I would say is just remember what, what I said earlier about do good, do well. Uh, you, have to, you have to absolutely do well uh, be successful at it, but also do good. Make sure it's for the right reason. And with that, I hope uh, this was helpful, but uh, uh, I will tell you that the fact that the three of you didn't turn off your cameras is is my sign of success. <laughs> no, it's really, you know, it's been an honor to sit here and listen to you just share your, you know, invaluable insights and experiences with us today. I think we've learned a lot and it's really inspiring to hear your journey. Um, and I'm sure our listeners will think the same. Um, you know, it's been an honor to have you here as a guest on the Southwest Spotlight series. Um, and then to our listeners, thank you for joining us on this illuminating journey. Uh, stay tuned for more conversations with past Safa board members and leaders in the field as we continue to explore the diverse narrative shaping the landscape of South Asian public health. Um, I know you had mentioned Arnim's name, so he's actually going to be our next podcast. So we have a lot of great ones coming up as well. Um, and so, you know, don't forget to follow us on YouTube and Spotify for updates um, and consider supporting Safa's mission by visiting www.safa.org. Um, until next time, this is Samira, Aisha, and Mushira signing off. Thank you.